today's topic is mesopharyngeal carcinoma or MPC. Okay, so this one is a very important topic in uh, with respect to FMG. Almost every year, they, whenever there is a question from ENT, NPC is the first target. Okay, so this is a very, in, in fact, this is not a very large topic or the extent of the topic is not very uh, in depth. Okay, so we just have to know some uh, specific information. So uh, after that, we can easily answer the questions. Okay, so we start with NPC. Here, the malignant cells from the tissues of the nasopharynx. Okay, so malignant cells form the tissues of the nasopharynx. That means the nasopharynx, the covering of the inner covering or the inner epithelium of the nasopharynx is completely covered by cancerous cell. Okay, so this is the finding of this is the cytological finding of nasopharyngeal carcinoma, cytological or histopathological. A finding of NPC or nasopharyngeal carcinoma. That means the entire inner, inner epithelium of the nasopharynx is completely replaced by malignant cells or cancerous cell. Now we will see the causative factor that is etiology. This is Epstein Barr virus or EBV. So the NPC is basically viral in origin. Okay, so this is a viral induced carcinoma okay another viral induced carcinoma is hpv okay hpv can cause cervical cancer okay so the causative organism of npc is epstein barr virus or ebv okay sometimes in the question this is directly referred to as ebv okay the risk factors number one is race okay which race are more prone to develop npc these are Chinese and Asian ancestry. That means this particular cancer is more common in Asian race. Okay, this is more common among Asian race for Chinese or Asian ancestry. So this uh, this itself is a risk factor. That means the origin of the patient itself is a risk factor for NPC to develop. The next risk factor is EBV exposure. That means exposure to this particular virus. Okay. Next is pathological types. There are three types of NPC or three uh, histopathological. Based on the histopathological structure, NPC can be divided into three types. Number one is keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. Number two is non-keratinizing carcinoma and number three is undifferentiating carcinoma so by the name itself we can have an idea keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma that means here it is uh, understood it is very clear that the inner epithelium of the nasopharynx is replaced by squamous cell squamous cells which type of squamous cells keratinized squamous epithelium Okay, so the nasopharyngeal lining would be replaced by malignant keratinized squamous cell epithelium. Okay. Next one is uh, non-keratinizing uh, non-keratinizing carcinoma. Here, the inner lining or inner epithelium of the nasopharynx would be replaced by malignant non-keratinizing epithelium. Okay. And the next one is undifferentiated carcinoma. That means here the nasopharyngeal lining would be replaced by undifferentiated cells. The cells would not be having any particular structure or function. That is why they are known as undifferentiated cells. Okay. So these are the basic histopathological types of NPC. So uh, in the questions, uh, it often comes like which of the following is not a type of NPC? So they would uh, they would give all these three like keratinizing HCC, uh, non-keratinizing uh, carcinoma, undifferentiated carcinoma, and columnar carcinoma. Columnar carcinoma. Okay. So or adenocarcinoma. Okay. So we will have to exclude the one which is not among these three. Okay. So we will have to be very careful while answering the questions. 
Next is epidemiology. This NPC is more common among the age group of 30 to 50 years. Okay, 30 to 50 years. And this is more common among male than in female. And the ratio is male is to female is equal to 2 is to 1. That means the males are twice more prone to get this cancer than the females. Okay. Now we will see the early symptoms. These are neck lump or nose lump. See, as the, uh, as the carcinoma is basically uh, affects the mesopharynx. That means this is a junction of nose and the uh, neck. Okay, nose and the throat. So, whenever this carcinoma is uh, affecting a patient, he or she will be having symptoms in the nose as well as in the throat. Okay, so there might be neck lump or nose lump. There might be there might be mass in the neck or mass in the nose. And this is the earliest symptom of NPC. So this can uh, uh, this can obviously form an MCQ asking like which of the following is the earliest symptom of NPC. And they will give all these options. And what happens is that all these options are true. The, all these are symptoms of NPC. But we have to find the earliest, we have to find the earliest symptoms. Sometimes uh, what happens is that a student uh, like we uh, often think that the milder symptoms like sore throat and uh, difficulty in speech, etc. These are the earlier symptoms. Okay. But here we have to remember that neck lump or nose lump are the earliest earliest symptom of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Even among this neck lump and nose lump, nose lump is nose lump is a uh, nose lump comes earlier than the neck lump. Okay, so nose lump comes earlier than the neck lump. But together as a whole, this mass in the neck or throat area is the earliest symptom of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Okay. Next is sore throat, breathing trouble. Whenever there is a mass in the uh, nose or even if there is there is no mass but the nasopharynx is affected, that will obviously cause trouble in the breathing. Next is difficulty in speech. So since the nasopharynx is affected, there would be difficulty in speech. It might be associated with epistaxis or nosebleed. This is very, uh, what to say, this is quite obvious and quite valid in case of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Next is trouble in hearing. Since it would, in the advanced stage, uh, it would affect the uh, nerves. It would affect the nerves and cause neural, sensory neural hearing loss, not conductive hearing loss. Okay. Next is earache and Tinnitus, as we have already known that tinnitus means constant ringing sound or constant drum beating sounds in, inside the ear in absence of the exact stimulus. Okay? So there will not be any ringing sound in the environment or any drum beating sound in the environment, but the patient would be complaining that I am hearing uh, ringing sound in my ear or I am hearing drum beating sound in my ear. Okay? So this occurs due to his neural weakness due to his auditory or neural weakness which type of which neural uh, or which nerve is affected the eighth nerve is affected here okay or auditory nerve is affected here the next is headache so this is quite obvious that whenever there is a uh, severe pathology in the head that means or in the uh, that means in the nasopharynx nasopharynx comes under head so whenever there is a severe pathology in the head and the immunocompromise and the immunity status of the patient is compromised there would be headache okay? even if a person is weak like in the convalescence period or if he or she has recovered from a severe illness and there is no other pathology the patient is completely recovered from the presenting illness there would be headache due to weakness so headache is very common okay and so these are the early uh, symptoms of the 
NPC. So number one is nose lump or mass in the nose, which is the earliest, and number two is uh, mass in the neck, which is the second earliest. Okay. Next is sore throat, breathing trouble, difficulty in speech, epistaxis or uh, nasal bleeding, trouble in hearing, earache, tinnitus, and headache. Okay. So next we will see the symptoms of the adverse stage of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So when this carcinoma or when this cancer progresses, then the more and more nerves are uh, involved. Okay, more and more nerves are affected and damaged. So what are the nerves that these are damaged in case of nasopharyngeal carcinoma? These are abducens, trigeminal trochlear and oculomotor that means cranial nerve 6, cranial nerve 5, cranial nerve 4 and cranial nerve 3 and this is the order of involvement of these nerves that is why I have presented in this manner okay that means 6, 5, 4, 3 just in the descending order so by this uh, by this presentation you can have an idea about the symptoms okay so whenever the, these nerves will be involved, like trigeminal, when it involves trigeminal nerve, there would be uh, there would be trigeminal neuralgia and there would be severe pain. Trigeminal neuralgia is considered as uh, one of the most painful conditions of the whole uh, med whole um, medical science. Okay, so trigeminal uh, neuralgia is severely painful. Okay, there is excruciating pain in case of trigeminal neuralgia, oculomotor, trochlear, uh, abducens, all this uh, would lead to the ocular, lead to development of ocular symptoms. Okay, that means the vision of the patient will also be affected in the later stages or in the adverse stages. Okay, so we we should remember this particular order. That means six five four three, six five four three. Okay. Next is remote symptoms. Remote symptoms means uh, uh, when there is long standing uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, then it would be these symptoms would be presenting. These are like metastatic lesions in the lung or in distant organs. That means in the that means in the long standing cases, there would be metastasis. There would be metastasis. So there might be lesions, there might be lesions in the lung or in other distant organs. So depending upon the site of metastasis, there would be different symptoms which would be presenting as the consequence, as the remote consequence of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Okay. So these are the uh, pictures nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Here as you can see that there is a mass in the nose area. Okay, there is a mass in the nose and see the whole epithelium has been changed okay there is uh, the, the characteristic or classical feature of classical histopathological feature of any type of cancer is the loss of demarcation you know the the normal cells are properly differentiated okay but whenever there is cancer there is loss of differentiation and loss of demarcation usually any benign mass and cancerous mass or benign mass and malignant mass mass are distinguished by just just by their demarcation just by their uh, what to say just by their margin and boundary in case of benign mass the boundary is very well def uh, very well defined you know but in case of malignant mass it is like it is scattered okay it is uh, kind of punched out. It is uh, not very well demarcated. Not very well demarcated uh, margin is there. Okay. So here, as you can see, that the whole epithelium is damaged and scattered. There is no uh, proper, no distinct boundary here. See, everything is. Uh, it's like uh, everything is scattered. Everything is punched out. Kind of uh, lesion. There is no no nice no crisp boundary anymore okay and here there is a mass and there is bleeding coming out 
there is blood oozing out from this mass okay and you can see some blood vessels here that means there is neovascular neovascularization which actually promote the growth which promotes the growth of this mass since there is mass and there is blood vessel in the mass that means this blood vessel will provide nutrition to this cancerous mass which will keep on growing up in size okay so this is the classical picture of nasopharyngeal carcinoma okay next is here here uh, here you can see that the mass is in the pharynx okay uh, the uh, not mass uh, yes there is a mass in the pharynx this one okay and the entire epithelium of the pharynx is uh, congested and is uh, the blood vessels are engorged and some sort of bleedings are uh, some sort of bleeding is also there so this is another classical feature of npc or pharyngeal carcinoma okay next is this one here this is a ct here you can see there there is a mass okay there is a mass uh, this one is radio opaque see this one is not that much radio opaque this one is radio opaque that one, that is why it is showing as a bright white portion so this is a feature of any radio opaque uh, entity okay so since this is radio opaque this is shown up as white why it is so much white cause there is blood again there is neovascularization and there is blood and blood itself is radio opaque okay with comparison to air uh, blood is radio opaque okay that is why this is showing up as bright white portion okay, due to the presence of blood in the mass okay next is diagnosis how to diagnose a nasopharyngeal carcinoma see the presenting features or the uh, actual pathology like the cancerous mass in the nose or in the throat area can be an isolated carcinoma as well that means it can be carcinoma of pharynx or carcinoma nose or any uh, nasal malignant mass so how would how would we know that this is a case of nasopharyngeal carcinoma and not a case of pharyngeal carcinoma or carcinoma nose so these are there are some diagnostic diagnostic criteria what are these these are number one which is the very important important uh, very important feature in the diagnostic in the diagnosis of npc is actually history so this is the number one um, number one uh, helpful tool in the diagnosis of npc so history history means exposure to uh, exposure to ebv or epstein barr virus or exposure to any place where there is a prevalence of npc okay next is signs and symptoms of npc so npc in case of uh, isolated pharyngeal carcinoma or isolated nasal carcinoma the symptoms would be different from that of npc in npc there would be combined symptoms there would be collective symptoms of both pharyngeal carcinoma and nasal carcinoma so by those by the presence of both these symptoms like the one of that the ones of the pharyngeal carcinoma and the ones of the nasal carcinoma are uh, present together okay so this is another characteristic feature of npc and this helps us to distinguish between isolated nasal or pharyngeal carcinoma and npc okay next is physical and diagnostic examination we would diagnose we would uh, perform a physical examination on the patient and uh, try to get this features get the features means whether we would check whether the patient is having a lump in the nose or a lump in the throat or both okay and we would be checking whether the patient's uh, sensory portions sensory sensory uh, senses are intact or not like whether the patient is being able to breathe uh, whether the patient is being able to smell properly whether the patient is having any uh, sensory neural hearing loss so we will check all these things and note down the uh, findings and this will help us to 
diagnosed in NPC. Okay. Next is diagnostic examination. So other than the uh, physical examination, we will have to uh, order some uh, investigation, especially especially some uh, imaging and and FNAC or uh, or cell biopsy or cytological biopsy. Uh, only by FNAC we can confirm the NPC. Okay. So uh, what are the imaging? The imaging techniques are CT and MRI. And in the blood examinations, we would check the blood counts and whether there is any presence of any uh, carcinogens or any Epstein Barr virus related uh, chemicals are present or not. And finally, we will order an uh, FNAC or a cell biopsy, which would confirm the diagnosis of NPC. Okay. So next is the treatment. The treatment of uh, any cancer or uh, treatment of any malignant condition usually lies on the basis of chemotherapy, radiotherapy and surgery. Okay, so if the stage is low, that means if the cancer is not so advanced, that means below stage 3, then we can perform surgery and we can eliminate the mass. But if it progresses beyond stage 3, then we cannot perform the surgery because there is a risk of incisional metastasis or surgical metastasis. Whenever there will be an incision or whenever there will be a surgical cut applied on the mass or applied with an intention to remove the mass, then by that incision only the cancer would spread to the related organs. Okay. So for this uh, fear or for this risk factor, we don't uh, perform surgery on any patient who is having cancer beyond stage 3 okay so treatments are treatment modalities are radiation therapy or radiotherapy chemotherapy surgery and com combined approach that means there would be all these three would be applied together okay so this is known as combined approach Now we will study some important points about pharyngitis. As the name suggests, the pharyngitis is an inflammation of pharynx. Okay, this might be this might be resulting from any infection or might be resulting from any other you know, stress on the vocal area. Okay. So the inflammation of pharynx most openly related to infection is known as pharyngitis. What are the causative uh, factors? These are virus, bacteria, physical or chemical stimulus, occupational hazard, chronic diseases. So uh, occupational hazard means in those professions where the patient has to constantly shout or constantly keep on talking in a moderate level of voice okay so over usage of the uh, vocal uh, box or vocal apparatus over usage of the vocal apparatus can lead to the pharyngitis okay so these are there are uh, different types of pharyngitis number one is acute pharyngitis number two is chronic pharyngitis and among chronic pharyngitis there are simple chronic pharyngitis and hypertrophic and atrophic chronic pharyngitis so acute phar apart from acute pharyngitis chronic pharyngitis itself has different types number one like simple chronic pharyngitis hypertrophic and atrophic chronic chronic pharyngitis so these are the types of pharyngitis 
Next, we will see the clinical manifestations or the signs and symptoms of uh, pharyngitis. So these are congestion, swelling, fever, sore throat. This is commoner in acute pharyngitis. Obviously, whenever the inflammation sets in in the earlier stage, there would be soaring of the throat. Okay, or the patient would would feel tenderness and pain in the throat. So this is known as soaring or soreness of throat. Throat. Okay, and there might be itching or there might be irritation associated with the so associated with the soreness. Next is FPS or foreign body sensation. The patient might be feeling that there is something stuck in my throat. So this is known as foreign body sensation. Foreign body sensation is um, this term, this particular term is also used in case of any eye problem or ophthalmic problem. Okay. So the, uh, in that case, the patient feels that there might be something, uh, some foreign body which is there in, which is left in his or her eyes. Okay. So this is known as foreign body sensation. Next is mucosal congestion. Mucosal congestion and, lymph, uh, and lymphoid tissue hypertrophy. This is, uh, this is more common in the chronic hypertrophic pharyngitis. So mucosal congestion means the mucous membrane, uh, mucous membrane would be congested or the mucous membrane would be, what to say, it would be uh, engorged. Okay? Next is lymphoid tissue hypertrophy. So this, uh, in, uh, in this one, the lymph, lymph nodes or the lymphoid tissues would be engorged and hypertrophied. Hypertrophied means there would be, they would all be increased in size. So these are the pictures of pharyngitis. See here the pharynx portion, the pharynx portion, this, this one is known as oropharynx. Okay. So this is the first part or oro, uh, this is the oropharynx. This is the second part of the pharynx. Number one is nasopharynx, number two is oropharynx and number three is laryngopharynx. So this portion is oropharynx. See the oropharynx is implant and it has become very reddened and there is hyperemia. So this is a feature of pharyngitis. Okay? Here also you can see the whole oropharynx along with the tonsil portion along with the tonsils are highly inflamed and here the entire entire oropharynx as well as the soft palate as well as the soft palate and the some portions of the hard palate like this portion this above portion is highly inflamed so these are all uh, different parts different types of pharyngitis okay this one is the most severe one okay treatment obviously the treatment which uh, would include antibiotic in case of infective pharyngitis and there would be analgesics in, uh, to relieve the patient from the pain mouthwash with sodium borate solution so this would help in eliminating the pathogens as well as in soothing the throat next is laser laser can be laser can be applied to relieve the patient from the uh, from the pathology uh, in in a way that uh, by application of laser beams we can we can eliminate the hypertrophy of the uh, associated of the related uh, portions okay so if laser is applied that would shed the hypertrophic hypertrophic area okay next is microwave can be applied for the same reason and next is low temperature plasma plasma this can be given to the patient and vitamin a vitamin b2 vitamin c and vitamin e have been proved to be effective as an uh, as a supplement or as an uh, augmentation to the mainstay of therapy
we will see the anatomical features of the larynx okay so as we have progressed in the ENT in ENT we have uh, we have studied ear then nose then throat in this throat area we have seen pharynx and larynx okay in the pharynx we have uh, the pharynx is divided into mesopharynx oropharynx and laryngopharynx and so after laryngopharynx there is the continuation of larynx so so larynx comes after pharynx okay after uh, and most uh, more specifically larynx comes after laryngopharynx laryngopharynx is a part of pharynx okay so you know, larynx comes after laryngopharynx or pharynx okay so now we will see the anatomical features of the larynx okay this is 5 to 7 cm long upper boundary starts at the tip of the epiglottis and opposite to the third to fourth cervical vertebra so this boundary or this anatomical demarcation is very important that the upper boundary of the larynx starts at the tip of the epiglottis opposite the third to fourth cervical vertebra that means c3 to c4 okay so the so the upper end of the uh, larynx starts from c3 to c4 the lower end is at the the lower end of the larynx <coughs> is at the sorry, lower border of the cricoid cartilage opposite c6 or six cervical vertebra so we have to remember that the larynx starts from c3 to c4 and it ends at c6 c6 or cervical 6 vertebra the structural rigidity of the larynx is provided by three medium cartilages number one is epiglottis number two is thyroid cartilage and number three is cricoid cartilage that means the structural rigidity means the structural stiffness or the integrity of the larynx is maintained by three cartilaginous structures number one is epiglottis number two is thyroid cartilage and number three is cricoid cartilage so together these three cartilages help in maintaining the shape and the rigidity or the stiffness of the cartilage of the uh, larynx okay six smaller cartilage of the larynx so apart from these three uh, these three cartilages apart from these three actually unpaired cartilages there are six there are three pairs of cartilages so, so there are three paired cartilages and three unpaired cartilages so three paired cartilages means six in number this one and three unpaired cartilages means three in number okay so among these uh, three paired cartilages what are these these are arytenoid corniculate cuneiform arytenoid that means one pair of arytenoid or two arytenoid cartilage one pair of corniculate or two corniculate cartilage and one pair of cuneiform cartilage or two cuneiform cartilages okay so together they, there are six cartilages okay two of each of this arytenoid corniculate and cuneiform cartilage okay so we have to remember these names and the and the fact that these three that means epiglottis thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage these are unpaired and this arytenoid corniculate and cuneiform are paired that means there are two of each type of cartilages okay involved with the movement of vocal cords so these six paired cut uh, these three paired cartilages that means six uh, six in collectively there are six cartilages these are involved in the movement of the vocal cords okay these by the movement of these uh, three pairs cartilages there is the movement of the vocal cord that means we can speak so this is the picture of the thyroid cartilage okay so this it is a bilobed bilobed in nature so this is this is known as the isthmus or the junction and these are the two uh, lobes of the thyroid cartilage 
so whenever there is thyroid thyroid uh, whenever there is pharyngitis so there would be there would be inflammation and there would be there would be this type of this uh, what to say this type of liquefaction would be there this one okay thyroid cartilage is shield shaped or hook shaped see if we look at this this uh, i mean they they are considered that this looks like a uh, like an open book okay like this is one page and this is another page so this is this this that's why they call it a book shaped cartilage okay? so this opens posteriorly that means this is see here uh, this is in the front portion this is and this is uh, joined by isthmus okay or this portion and this can open this can open posteriorly okay that means this can uh, at the back portion as you can see in this picture this can open posteriorly that means the book is uh, the book is uh, in the the book is actually inverted okay the, the book is inverted and it, it opens posteriorly okay anteriorly this is anteriorly this is uh, joined by this isthmus and posteriorly this can open freely okay it's it's like a hinged hinged uh, portion which can open posteriorly okay next is angulated anteriorly here the book is obviously this is there is there is an angle see here this angle is talking is they are talking about here so this is angulated anteriorly included angle is obtuse in female and acute in male this is responsible for the laryngeal prominence in the male okay so this angle is obtuse in female that means this is more that means this is more than 90 degree in case of female and this is acute in more in case of male so if this angle is if this angle is small that means this is this angle is acute or less than 90 degree that means here would be protrusion okay so if this angle is more then it would be more spread it would be more spread and there would be no protrusion okay but if this angle is acute it would be there would be protrusion like this okay and if the angle is if the angle is more it would be spread it would be spread in a large area and the protrusion would be less so that is why there is a protrusion in the adult male okay so after the proper development of the thyroid cartilage there would be a protrusion in case of male okay so since the angle in the angle included in the thyroid cartilage is acute in case of male and obtuse or more than 90 degree in case of female so this uh, this prominence is known as the laryngeal prominence in the male so this is the this is due to the acute uh, due to the acute angle of the included angle of thyroid is uh, acute in case of male this protects larynx from injury that means thyroid cartilage protects larynx from injury obviously this one is the larynx and over this above and over this there is the thyroid cartilage so thyroid cartilage guards the laryngeal structure so this protect this provides a mechanical product protection to the larynx okay next is it provides attachment to the vocal cords obviously thyroid cartilage it provides attachment it helps to helps the vocal cord to attach with the larynx okay next is cricoid cartilage this is signet ring shaped this is stronger than thyroid cartilage okay so cricoid cartilage is stronger than thyroid cartilage and it is signet ring shaped the lamina 2 to 3 cm from above downwards considerably broader than anterior arch the important from structural this is important from structural and functional point of view the this is there 
receptor this forms that means cricoid cartilage forms the base of the entire larynx okay so next we will see the cavity of the larynx there is three parts of the cavity of the larynx number one is supraglottic number two is glottic and number three is infraglottic see glottic means what glottic means this one is related to the tongue so supraglottic supraglottic means above the tongue glottic glottic means just near the tongue or related to the tongue and infraglottic means below the tongue portion okay so by this way we can clearly remember these three structure number one is supraglottic or over the tongue number two is glottic and number three is infraglottic supraglottic glottic and infraglottic parts of the larynx so supraglottic parts it includes what it includes ventricles false vocal false vocal cord or ventricular cord okay or ventral cord laryngeal surface of the epiglottis arid uh, and airy epiglottic folds airy means related to arytenoid and airy epiglottic folds means the fold which is related to both arytenoid and epiglottis okay so in the supraglottic part what is there there is epiglottis so there would be structure which is related to the epiglottis and the tongue okay so in the laryngeal surface of epiglottis would be there and airy epiglottic folds would be there that means the folds which are related to both arytenoid and epiglottis would be there next is glottic part so this glottic part means the one which is near in the near uh, the tongue okay this is known as true cord so this portion this supraglottic portion contains false cord or ventricular cord and this one this glottic part contains the true cord true cord means true vocal cord the anterior commissure and the posterior commissure can be can be found in this portion okay next is rima glottis this is a narrow triangular place between the three cords okay so this this rima glottis is a important structure is an important structure okay so this is a narrow triangular space between the three cords okay so the next one is anterior two third is membranous so anterior two third of the cricoid cartilage is membranous and the uh, and the posterior one third consists of vocal processes of arytenoids okay so anterior two two third is membranous that means there is more membranous part than the arytenoid part okay and the posterior one third consists of the vocal processes of the arytenoid cartilage next one is the infraglottic part that means the structure below the glottic part okay so this one is infraglottic part and this is also known as subglottic part sub means also below infra both infra and sub means below okay so this part is about 5 mm below the free margin of the vocal cord this is a very short portion which is which lies below the uh, margin of the vocal cord and obviously below the tongue so now we will see the nerve supply of this laryngeal area so basically the nerve supply of the laryngeal uh, laryngeal area is derived all are derived from the vagus nerve so sub laryngeal nerve this one is sorry supra laryngeal nerve a super, superior laryngeal nerve sorry superior laryngeal nerve is the, the internal branch of superior laryngeal nerve is sensory to glottis and supraglottis and the external branch of superior laryngeal nerve is motor to cricothyroid so the superior laryngeal nerve has two branches one is internal one is external so the internal branch is sensory in nature say, say since vagus is a mixed nerve that means it has both sensory and motor function okay so the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve is sensory to glottis and supraglottis and this the external branch is motor to cricothyroid okay see 
they, this is uh, and this internal branch is sensory to glottis and supraglottis that means area uh, that means tongue area and the area above the tongue is uh, served by this internal branch of superior laryngeal nerve as sensory nerve and this the external branch is served as a motor nerve to the cricothyroid next is recurrent laryngeal nerve this one is a very important nerve in the laryngeal area and in the thyroid area okay as uh, you must have uh, studied it in the surgery as well so whenever we have to do thyroidectomy we have to protect this recurrent laryngeal nerve okay so next is next is the internal branch of the recurrent laryngeal nerve is sensory to subglottic area and the external branch is motor to the intrinsic muscles of larynx except cricothyroid see here this uh, glottis and the supraglottis area has have already been covered by this superior laryngeal nerve so which is left left is subglottic or infraglottic area so this one is served by the internal branch of the recurrent laryngeal nerve and see here the cricothyroid cricothyroid's motor function has been already covered by this superior laryngeal nerve the external branch so what is left the left is the in, uh, intrinsic other intrinsic muscle of the larynx so uh, except cricothyroid since cricothyroid has already been covered by this superior laryngeal nerve so exterior uh, external branch of the recurrent laryngeal nerve would serve the uh, intrinsic muscles of the larynx except cricothyroid so uh, since the cricothyroid has already been covered by the superior laryngeal nerve so external branch of recurrent laryngeal nerve would be uh, would be serving the motor function of the intrinsic muscles of the larynx okay physiological functions of the larynx so these are respiration phonation phonation means speaking okay speech that means phonation means making or production of sound okay sound making or making of uh, phonetics so making of phonetics so that means creating sound that means speech so respiration speech and swallowing so whenever there is any uh, pathology in the laryngeal area or in the larynx area there would be difficulty in swallowing or deglutination de de okay or uh, there would be dysphagia that means difficulty in eating so next is the this is this picture is the cavity of the cavity of the mm -hmm. larynx so this is divided into supraglottic glottic and infraglottic or subglottic area see this is the anterior commissure anterior commissure of the larynx this is the posterior commissure of the larynx so this one is anterior this one is posterior here uh, the there is the thoracic cavity and there 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 would be the this is the part which is facing the uh, vertebras okay so and this is a transverse section of the larynx okay this is a transverse section of the larynx this is the true vocal cord okay this is the true vocal cord this portion this is a false vocal cord okay this remains in the supra uh, in the supraglottic area yeah? and this is the ventricle this is the ventricle this inside portion is known as the ventricle and this is known as the airy epiglottic fold this portion is known as the airy epiglottic fold also this portion so this portion and this portion is the airy epiglottic fold next is acute epiglottitis so this is an inflammation of the epiglottis this might be related to infection or this might be due to some other noxious stimulus we will see in the course of the slide so etiology or the uh, causative organisms these are h influenzae or type b hemophilus influenzae streptococcus staphylococcus aureus direct trauma that means direct injury internal injury infection of adjacent tissue so these are the causative factors of this epiglottitis acute epiglottitis so this includes pathologic organism or bacteria as well as physical stress 
physical stress including direct trauma or internal injury internal injury means uh, infection or uh, damage of the uh, internal organs related to the epiglottis and infection in the adjacent tissue infection in the area which are related or which are near the epiglottis so these kind of uh, bacteria uh, physical and internal physical or external or internal injury in the epiglottic area can lead to the inflammation of the epiglottis which is known as epiglottitis okay so the clinical features or the clinical manifestation of acute epiglottitis are sudden onset so epiglottitis does not uh, does not occur in a very long period of time okay so there would be insidious onset or sudden onset okay there would be fever with chills so the patient would be having fever with shivering okay with a uh, short spell of shivering which is known as chills okay the throat obviously the throat will be sore there would be dyspepsia or difficulty in swallowing the food okay next is respiratory distress obviously if there is uh, any uh, problem in the neck area in the throat area in internal part of the throat area which are associated with the uh, trachea so there would be respiratory distress there might be shock why shock shock due to pain okay so shock there might be shock due to the pain and the chills with the uh, and the fever with the chills will also contribute in the development of shock okay next is toxic filling with fever so whenever there is toxemia whenever there is a built up of toxic materials maybe bacteria or maybe other toxic materials in the body there is a filling of toxic toxic filling in the body that means there would be fever or, or the patient would be feeling that the heat is radiating from his body and there would be vague body ache there would be vague body ache there would be uh, there would be what to say there would be burning sensation inside the body which is which is very characteristic of uremia as well you remember so whenever there is uremia or high uric acid in the body uh, then then the patient also feels a toxic feeling inside the body that means the entire the patient often con, uh, complains that my veins uh, normally the blood vessels are uh, referred to as veins by the patient the patient says that my veins are burning you know so this burning sensation is there in case of uremia as well as in case of toxemia so uremia is a type of toxemia since there is building uh, building up of uh, toxic material which is urine uric acid in case of uremia and here in here this is bacteremia or uh, built up of some other toxins due to this presence of this but bacteria okay so the toxic filling uh, 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 will be there uh in 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 the patient in case of this epiglottitis okay so toxic by this toxic filling the fever and the burning sensation and the fever like uh, the radiating heat radiating uh, heat wake and extreme body ache wake body ache means there will the pain will not be localized to any particular organ that means it not it will not be the patient will not be saying i am having headache or i am having pain in the abdomen so there would be vague overall body ache and it would be very severe and there would be burning sensation in the blood vessels okay so this is known as toxemia toxic feeling with fever strider strider means seizure drooling muffled voice that means the voice would be obviously if there is Uh, pathology in the epiglottis and the sound production or the voice box would be affected and the voice would be muffled that means the texture of the voice would be changed the epiglottic hyperemia endotracheal intubation not possible if severe hyperemia is present so hyperem hyperemia means engorged blood vessels and engorged engorged blood vessels like congested blood blood uh, congest the epiglottic area would be congested with blood vessels and there uh, and here the if the severe hyperemia is there then endotracheal intubation or ett is not possible okay sometimes we have to uh, use this into endotracheal intubation to help the patient to breathe properly okay 
so or to uh, help the patient with proper respiration okay so uh, if the hyperemia is more then endotracheal intubation is not possible so this is a contraindication of endotracheal intubation okay so whenever there is epiglottic hyperemia severe hyperemia then endotracheal intubation is not possible see this is epiglottis so in case of epiglottitis this portion would be inflamed and congested and there would be hyperemia and there would be pain there would be dysphagia here this is an endoscopic view of the epiglottis so the epiglottis can be seen here here the epiglottis is suppurative and there is formation of pus see this spot is there this whitish spot indicates the presence of pus okay so the pus results from the bacterial infection treatment large dose of antibiotics so whenever this there is a huge infection whenever the degree of the infection is huge then at least the first dose is first dose of the antibiotic is applied in a high dose which is known as the bolus dose okay so the subsequent doses might be smaller uh, relatively small but the first dose has to be applied uh, in a bolus dose or in a very high dose in a large dose which Uh, which actually helps in controlling the infection effectively okay next is intravenous steroids why steroids steroids is applied to reduce the inflammation as well as it would reduce any uh, if there is any collection of fluid that would reduce uh, the steroid would reduce that too but primarily the steroid is applied to control the inflammation okay next is orotracheal intubation orotracheal intubation is uh, actually done for the uh, for the assistance to the respiration to assist the patient with respiration the orotracheal intubation is done okay so whenever there is epiglottitis or severe epiglottitis then the patient will not be able to breathe properly okay so the uh, for maintaining uh, the uh, airway for maintaining the proper airway of the patient so this orotracheal intubation is done to help the patient with respiration next is cricothyroidectomy so in emergency condition when this epiglottitis has progressed to a huge extent where there is the involvement of cricoid and thyroid is there and the patient patient cannot breathe properly and the patient's condition is very uh, very severe the patient is going into shock and there is severe generalized toxemia in the body so there would be there were, there would be thyroid cricothyroidectomy done in the in the patient to relieve or to remove the inflamed or the, to remove the damaged or severely affected area which is causing obstruction in the airway and to reduce the toxemia or the bacteremia in the body we uh, do emergency cricothyroidectomy or the removal of cricoid and thyroid from the patient okay so the main stay of the treatment remains on medicinal treatment is antibiotic and steroid and the uh, operational treatment or the surgical treatment or semi surgical procedure this uh, constitute this is constituted by orotracheal intubation and cricothyroidectomy emergency cricothyroidectomy for this orotracheal intubation we have to remember that if there is severe hyperemia of the epiglottis we cannot do intubation okay so we have to remember that